All right, here we go again. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Metaphysical Egypt. I'm Alan Peoples with Patricia Aoyan Lehman, and this is part four of our series on the ancient magnetic equator and the Ark of the Covenant. Patricia, let's let's do it. Let's, let's go. Okay, so we've been talking about the ancient magnetic equator and that it ran through the Giza Plateau and its relationship with Tefnut. So I'm going to go a little deeper about how that all works. Um, and so, you know, Tefnut, <laughs> I used to live at the foot of the pyramids and I used to have coffee every morning. Um, and I, with the Sphinx, I used to say, I used to just sit out, we had this huge balcony um, and I used to just sit out in the morning and look at the Giza Plateau and look at the Sphinx and ponder um, why Hakim had, you know, was so adamant that the Sphinx was, you know, not only a, a female lioness, which I totally got. I mean, the minute I saw her for the very first time, I, I, I felt that this was a hugely significant feminine mother energy. Um, but that he, he, he called her, you know, Tefnut. And um, I sort of made it my mission to really delve in. You know, he passed away in 2008. And, of course, that was the year that I came to live in Egypt, you know. Um, and uh, so I didn't get the chance to really ask him specifically. But I wanted to know why he was so sure that she was Tefnut. And Tefnut, it, it, you know, Tefnut, the word itself, she's one of the netters, as, as we've been talking. She is the twin of Shu. She represents moisture. Um, and her name itself means the spit of Nut, the spit mm. of the heavens. And Hakim used to say, you know, by spitting, it's the spittle, right? It's that, you know, <laughs> like I said, a pop, you know, you, you know, spat into it's the... It's like heat. moisture plus force plus direction. Exactly. And so one day I saw this meme on social media and it said, never sleep where a cat sleeps. And I thought immediately, oh my gosh, you know, I, I grew up with cats. Literally, I grew up on a farm way out in the country, right? Um, and all the cats slept on my bed and, you know, all the dogs slept under my bed. But, you know, I, I've always had animals around me. I love the energy of animals. But, you know, I've had cats all my life. I have two cats now, and they always have to be on top of me. Um, and I thought to myself, well, you know, why wouldn't you sleep where a cat sleeps? So I started looking. Um, I, I, I Googled it immediately, you know, <laughs> just that <laughs> phrase, never sleep where a cat sleep. and, uh, sleep. and suddenly all these medical websites came up, and uh, they started to describe, you know, the fact that cats love the feeling of radiation, you know, you know, um, they like to be in, in you know, we're in, in, in geopathic stress zones, if you will. Um, and so the One Medical website started to describe these kind of places. And it, they described uh, places of underground running water um, and cavities. And, you know, it, literally they were describing the Giza Plateau. And that's when I had one of those aha moments, you know, ding. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, and it was like, oh my gosh, the Sphinx is a reclining cat, you know, and everything came together for me. I, I, I'll never forget it. And I thought, oh, wow. And I just, you know, and, and then I'm thinking, well, I had always thought she was in alignment with something, you know, just understanding, you know, the, the tone and the language. And I, I, you know, I knew she was in alignment with the, 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 the pyramids, but it dawned on me that, you know, if, if cats love you know, electromagnetism, radiation, uh, geopathic stress, uh, <laughs> that maybe, you know, they, that she was aligned with, you know, a very powerful magnetic current, you know, because I had studied earth grids and earth currents and telaric currents. And I thought, well, hmm. So I typed in Google again, Google. <laughs> I typed in um, ancient magnet. Uh, no, I just typed in magnetic equator, right? Just magnetic equator. And all of a sudden, you know, all these websites came up and we're, we're talking about we actually have a magnetic equator. I didn't even know we had a magnetic equator. All I learned in school from grade school on was that we had a geographic equator, right? I had never even known that we had a magnetic equator. 
So I, I found all that fascinating. And then I went ahead and typed in ancient magnetic equator, thinking, you know, you know, maybe there's something there. And that's when all this material started popping up, that there was an ancient magnetic equator and that it uh, was literally the one that I've already shown you several times. Um, and, you know, this is, this is basically uh, where I started to understand the dynamics of all the symbolism and all the mythology. Um, of Egypt, even the rituals, the Hepset festivals, everything is centered around this breath of life that is, you know, has these foundational wave patterns that make up our perception of reality and even the planet itself. Um, so I begin with that at this point um, right here, you know, by learning that, you know, cats, ants, and termites are all attracted to geopathic stress zones, mm -hmm. which sort of makes sense, you know, and, and we even have magnetite within our own cells. We had have this ability, but it's one of those senses we forgot we have. And I do believe at one time we could feel, sense, um, uh, navigate and harness these currents. So anyway, geopathic stress is natural radiation of kinetic energy that rises up through the earth, which can cause magnetic anomalies created by subterranean running water, certain mineral concentrations, fault lines, and underground cavities. So as I said, that really does describe the Giza Plateau. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, it's describing an area that is, is fertile, right? Um, crackling with life force. Um, and so I call it the fertility of the waters. And so, as I just said, I believe at one time we had this ability. And so, you know, I, I researched this a bit and, you know, I had noticed that, you know, it wasn't only in Egypt that, the, that certain priesthoods were able to wear a feline skin, a leopard skin, um, you know, even, even a lion uh, skin. Um, and I noticed, of course, that, you know, that the priests in South America, you know, could wear you know, the feline skins, and we're talking any of the felines, panther, lion, lep, you know, the, all of this. And I noticed it was tribes in Africa, and it was, it was basically, you know, ancient tribes worldwide were able to wear the feline skin if they had reached, I believe, a level of awareness. Again, that ability to sense and feel and navigate, harness the currents. Um, I think even our word magic comes from you know, magnetism or vice versa. <laughs> um, it's the ability to harness these currents to create what we would call magic today, supernatural, but was completely natural to them. Um, and here is a beautiful image on the right of Sachet. And Sachet, as I said, she, she is the grand architect and she does take the currency to create our perception of reality, matter itself. Um, and she is wearing the leopard skin um, and so, and you know, the, 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 the stars, we see the priest on the, on the left and he has stars, it's stars or leopard spots. And the stars represent that these priests were also the astrologers because they understood what we see in the patterns of the heavens above was happening right down here on earth. Mm -hmm. So Everything you know, is fractal. Again, exactly. It's all about the currency as above, so below. Um, and so, again, in that golden age of Aten, when we were the gods that walked the earth, we had these abilities. And then we slowly fell into form. You know, we, we forgot. We, we started to identify with our physical bodies and forgot that we were connected to everything that was and lost our abilities. Um, and the use of these 360 senses that Hakim and some of, some of the other indigenous elders worldwide speak about. So it's a feline, I've said it more than once. Um, <laughs> running east to west, here's a beautiful um, sketch of the Giza Plateau that shows you the Sphinx and um, where she's placed on the plateau. Um, and uh, yeah, she is. she's basically um, an east to west line. She faces east for the sun to rise. Um, she, it actually on um, the September equinox, uh, she it, it rises just exactly in front of her. Now, Hakim said he measured she was two, two degrees off, and that's why he thought she uh, she was uh, oh, originally. Oh, two full per processional cycles back. That's exactly, when she was originally carved out of the bedrock, the limestone bedrock. Um, 
So, and the pyramids are basically the ancient prime meridian ran right through um, the pyramids, the Giza Plateau as a north to south line. And I remember thinking about that prime meridian because I'd known, I'd known about the mare, you know, and meridians. But then I thought, you know, that maybe the Sphinx representing something even more powerful. Um, and I've come to believe that she absolutely does. Um, and so here is, here is where the prime meridian is today. It once ran through Giza and then they moved it um, to, it was going right through France and uh, Paris. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, Paris actually is Parisis, uh, the place of Isis, this feminine energy. Um, and, and that's important because we're gonna talk about when the ancient, the dual opposing wave spin of these Shu and Tefnut splits and, and one sort of migrates north and the other migrates south and the feminine energy is what goes north. Um, so that sort of makes sense to me. Um, and we see Isis, uh, we see black Madonnas in cathedrals all over Europe and even Russia that predate um, the uh, Christianity. Um, and this is that, the, you know, that feminine energy migrating north, just like the path of the Magdalene and um, uh, the path of Meritaten, which we'll talk about uh, the daughter, one of the daughters of Akhenaten. Mm -hmm. Um, taking that path north to where they say the prime meridian is today, which goes through Greenwich in England um, and uh, in the UK. So, you know, that's the that's the zero point for how we measure time on the planet. Um, oh, that's what Maritotten was doing, you think, on this voyage was following the path the, of the, the, the prime meridian. She was she was actually the original path of the Madonna. Right? We're talking it's about it, Scotia. Uh, uh, not of uh, the Magdalene, rather. Of uh, yes, yes. She gets to Scotland, and uh, she first goes to Ireland, and then Scotland. And they say that uh, she was called Scotia then, or Scotia, Sc yeah. <laughs> and that Scotland was named after her. Um, and they they even have her burial place in Ireland. It's a site that you can visit. Now, again, this is all speculative, mm -hmm. but I actually have a book. Um, actually, I have it in front of me. Uh, that was sent to me, Lorraine Evans, called The Kingdom of the Ark. Um, and she, she, does, she does a really beautiful, um, she does a beautiful job of uh, describing how this all could have come to pass, Maritotten actually existing and um, actually um, marrying a Greek, uh, someone from Greece, and then the two of them, when um, Akhenaten had to flee or whatever happened there at the fall of a Akhenaten's um, um, rulership, mm -hmm. she flees with her Greek husband and goes, you know, in the, the same path as the Magdalene, um, almost. It, it's really fascinating and ends up um, in Ireland and Scotland. And of course, there is uh, there are people that follow the idea of Mary Magdalene going north and she goes all the way up to Roslyn Chapel and you see imagery of her everywhere. I mean, I've, I've, I've been to Scotland several times. You were with me once, Alan, and, you know, it's just everywhere. There is this, you know, this uh, imagery and understanding of the locals of this, whatever she represents or the fact that she actually was there. Um, and that's something, you know, we can do a whole episode on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we will. <laughs> <laughs> we probably will, exactly. Um, and especially Maritotten and, as I said, Akhenaten. There's just so much um, that has to do with that time period. So as I pointed out before, this is an image of a sphinx on a birthing box um, on the ceiling of Dendera uh, with a serpent on its head. Um, I showed you an earlier image. Serpent represents fertility, uh, the feminine um, serpent energy is, 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 you know, this energy of fertility. Um, and um, there's even a netter, uh, uh, netter feminine who is, has the serpent head and uh, she is the fertility of the land. Um, and so this particular uh, image is said to be the Ka of Ra. Um, and so I find this again fascinating because the pyramid, the middle pyramid was supposedly um, 
attributed to Kafre, who Hakim said was the Ka of Ra, right? Ka F Ra, Kafre. <laughs> um, and it translates as the shining of Ra, as the vital force emanating from the sun, right? Um, and that vital force as the breath of life that circles the planet. Hmm, all starting to make sense, right? This is the life force of the planet that all began here at Zet Tepi the first time. Um, so, yeah, Tefnut was not said to be both the left moon and the right sun, eyes of Ra, representing both heavenly sources of light, both the sun and dryness and the moon and moisture. Now, as as the um, as the nurturing rays of the sun, you know, again, there's the story of Sekhmet. It's so similar, and I think it tells a similar story um, to Tefnut when we fall off. You know, when the when the Earth falls off its axis, um, or we fall into this perception of um, a physical reality. Uh, Sekhmet describes this, you know, her story um, describes this as does uh, the story of Tefnut, which is what we're going to focus on now. So I would ask the question, uh, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant, right, and the ancient magnetic equator. So I would say maybe the Ark refers to the Ark with A-R-C of two major magnetic lines or meridians coming together at a crossing point. Mm -hmm. Meridians and magnetic lines are in are arc in sine waves as cosmic serpents. They reflect the constellation of Draco in the circumpolar stars as the great feathered serpent of the heavens. The arc could be a metaphor for, the, for an ancient and powerful magnetic equator that has now slipped south to Nubia, Ethiopia, when the earth tilted on its axis, causing the last major global cataclysm, throwing us off balance and out of Ma'at. The Great Pyramid at the Prime Meridian and other monuments and temples were built to harness and enhance the magnetic pulsing, vibrating energy of this and other magnetic lines of fertility or earth currents. The Mamises or birthing chambers dedicated to Hathor at the temples in Egypt celebrate the spark of life as the electromagnetic pulse, sound that creates matter as the physical expression of life. The covenant are coming together of two dual opposing currents as a vortex or zero point refers to Zeptepi, the first time of the breath of life as the ancient magnetic equator that was in alignment with the pause of the Sphinx. This major crossing point once occurred at Giza and the covenant was intensified and harnessed in the Great Pyramid within the King's Chamber. The land of Osiris, which parallels the flow of the Nile, which is also symbolized by the path of Viracocha in the Andes in Peru, right? And the lines of Vishnu in India ran perpendicular to the magnetic equator as the prime meridian. So you basically have these masculine lines vertical and the, the um, horizontal lines as um, feminine lines of fertility. And by harnessing, I mean harnessing. <laughs> so we've seen this image before. I love, I love it. I, I found this on social media, of course, um, and uh, the image on the left showing uh, Hakim basically and Zai Hawass. Um, but you know, they're they're it, it's comparing the comparing comparing the Giza uh, pyramid, the Great Pyramid, with Tesla's uh, Wardenclyffe Tower as something that harnesses this energy of this geopathic stress zone, um, built to amplify, magnify, and harness the currents, which is Heka, that's magic, right? Mm -hmm. um, powerful. And this is, this, is, this is what it's all about. This is what the netters are, forces of nature. You know, they, I believe they, they created these megalithic temples structures, pyramids, by harnessing the currents because they could feel them, feel them. They understood these forces of nature and how, you know, they they were stronger at certain periods, you know, you know, when the when the moon was in a certain position or, you know, the stars, they understood all these aspects of of the movement of everything and they knew how to harness it again to um, to create magic. So what does this line look like? If, at, look like 
If you're looking down on the globe, uh, you can see on the left that it forms like this circle that is connecting all these sites that we talked about. And what's fascinating is that um, the angle that, it, that you see from the center point um, on the globe, when, it, uh, when you draw a line toward Giza and you draw a line toward Angkor Wat, it forms this 51.5 degree angle, which is the same as the angle of the Great Pyramid. Um, and these images are from Jim Allison again. Um, and what I found even more fascinating is the installation of Harp, which we talked about in an earlier episode, um, uh, <laughs> which you know I, I hope you're familiar with, is was literally um, uh, centered right at the what would have been the North Pole of the Earth during this, you know, when the Earth was in complete alignment and we had this ancient magnetic equator. Um, so I, I do believe it's the Ka'afra and it moves <laughs> um, after, you know, after the breath, as we, as we process, it starts to move. Um, so when we talk about, you know, the, the um, uniting upper and lower Egypt as the two hemispheres of the brain, you know, the, the red crown and the, and the white crown um, of Horus, you know, uh, he gets to wear the two combined because he's, he's transmuted his polarity, right? Um, well, we're talking about this line that separates uh, the, the, the two <laughs> parts of Egypt. I wanted to say upper and lower, but you immediately go to upper. It's funny that what we see in the northern part is lower Egypt, and in the lower part, it's upper Egypt. So south was considered up, also mm -hmm. significant. But it runs right through um, Memphis, basically. And it makes me question how wide a path did this ancient magnetic um, energy flow? How, you know, how wide a path was it? Um, does it encompass, you know, Giza, Memphis, that, you know, that entire area, which would make sense to me. Um, but it was the line that divided upper and lower Egypt, the northern and southern magnetic hemispheres. Uh, through the Giza Plateau, Saqqara, and Memphis, the place of Septepi and and Ptah, because Ptah, you know, was the it was, the home of Ptah was Memphis, and he is that projection into form. You know, he he represents that process of becoming physical from out of the blue, primordial waters. Um, so you know, like I said, it all begins to make sense. And so here's this geographic equator that, you know, I learned about in school. Um, and it's, you know, it's basically just a marker, a great circle around the earth that is everywhere equidistant from the geographic poles and lies in a plane perpendicular to the earth's axis. So there you have it. That's the difference. <laughs> One is all about life force. So my next question, of course, is, well, you know, where is the magnetic equator today? Um, and so we're looking at it in this image, and you can see it it's cuts this wide path. But, but what typifies it is it's totally out of mind. It's literally all over the place and moving. You know, the currency is basically it, it's out of balance. It's chaotic. So we, we went from this beautiful line that was just this balanced line around the, around the, the sphere of the globe into this line, this, this huge path of line that's all over the place. And that describes where we're at today, you know, a completely out of balance separation consciousness. Basically, what we're looking at is, you know, what we saw before was the magnetic, you know, the magnetic equator as this beautiful line in harmonic, harmonic resonance. And now we're looking at it in, it, you know, in complete dissonance, you know, totally out of resonance, uh, harmonic resonance, out of harmony, out of ma'at. Mm. Um, and I just saw this, someone uh, just posted this, um, Ron Rubel from Rubel's Wanderings on social media. Um, and uh, I, I found it fascinating. Um, it's it's from Mexico, but if you look, you see these little these little felines, right? And they're riding currents. There's a little spiral in front of the one in front, and then it has that spiraling three spirals on top of them. Um, and I love what they said. They call this the triad of felines, right? The cats mm -hmm. depicted in the monolith appear to have supernatural traits. 
such as flaming eyebrows and stylized mouths and very reminiscent of traditional Olmec masks. Archaeologists have dated most of the Olmec stone pieces to the early pre-classic period with some middle pre-classic uh, period. But the stones themselves cannot be directly dated, of course, because uh, you, you can't uh, carbon date them. Uh, so they could be many thousands of years older. But, you know, this imagery and what I'm pointing out, I could put up thousands of images from all over the world that speak to currency and fee lines. Um, but I, I, I do sort of want to drive the point home that, you know, I didn't just make this stuff up. Um, it, it's literally everywhere. Um, and so, you know, I've told the story about Tefnut before, but I'll, I'll say it again. The mythology of Tefnut is that she angrily leaves a corrupted Kemet. Um, you know, it had fallen out of Maat, out of balance. You know, this lush and amazing Egypt became an arid desert. Um, and so Ra gets upset <laughs> because he's afraid that, you know, um, it, you know, that, that, Egypt will never be what it was before. And he sends Shu, her brother, her twin brother, and Toth, Jehudi, consciousness, to encourage her to come back to Kemet. And when Tefnut returns, she brings the water with her, the life force, back to Egypt. Um, and as she passes through each town and village, there is a great rejoicing. She brings the heart back to Egypt. Um, now, of course, this story describes the annual cycle of the flooding of the Nile um, because this did happen. The Nile recedes and everything becomes arid and dry, you know, even today. And then the Nile, you know, unfortunately, we don't have the floods anymore. But when, the, when we had the annual floods, everything becomes lush and green and beautiful. Um, but I'm talking about a much larger cycle, and I would call it the Great Year Cycle, when, you know, at a time we know geologically at that time, Egypt was lush. All of Egypt was lush and amazing, mm -hmm. full of life force. It was like a savanna. And today, it's, yeah, exactly. And today it is a dry and desolate desert, arid desert. And water is life force. And when you lose the life force, it's death. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it is a story. It's a story told around the world. We've talked about this before. It's either the rainy season, a river flooding, but it's this um, ebb and flow of life force itself that typifies cycles and cycles within cycles. But they did have these amazing festivals to celebrate um, this return of the life force. And in this case, I'm going to talk about, you know, uh, a, a Sekhmet, something related to Sekhmet. But like I said, it's the same understanding. Um, and so this, these festivals, they, they celebrated it when the Nile flooded, of course. Um, a meeting of heaven and earth after a moment of silence when they passed out, right? During the ancient festival of drunkenness that commemorated the power and mythologies of Sekhmet and Tefnut. Um, and so uh, Sophia Aziz, from Sleep and Dream Therapy in Ancient Egypt says, prior to the Timaeic period, the Egyptians engaged more often in rites such as the festival of drunkenness in honor of the goddess Sekhmet, which is discussed, she's referring to an issue, uh, a, a, a publication. In this festival, participants would get drunk, really, really drunk until they passed out. And we see imagery of this, um, and you know it, it's it, it's incredible. Then, in the early hours of the morning, with the revelers soundly asleep, they would be suddenly awakened by loud drumming to encounter the sacred cult statue of the goddess. It was hoped that in this hungover moment, the festival goers would achieve a trance-like state and cross over to the liminal zone of dreams and gods, resulting in an intense communal moment with the divine. Um, I don't know. I can remember the early days when I would wake up hungover, and I'm not sure that loud sound would have sent me to the divine. Um, <laughs> but it's an interesting idea. Might send someone else to the divine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was thinking that, but I wasn't going to say it out loud. <laughs> But I showed this imagery before, and I'm only going to show this image now of the party of the Nubians dancing and playing, and um, it, it's just beautiful imagery. I take this image, uh, took this picture at uh, 
fillet at Temple of Isis, and there's a, a Hathor chapel there, and it just it shows this moment when Tefnut, the life force, comes back to Egypt. The heart is restored, and you see um, you see this image of um, probably a Ptolemaic prince or king, and he's He's basically offering the Sphinx, holding this, this jug of, I would think, life force. You know, this is water. This is life force. Mm -hmm. um, and he's presenting this to Tefnut herself. It's the restoration of the heart, um, the Holy Grail, back to Egypt as the floods, um, the annual floods come back. And I founded this meme, and I just think they're so funny. How did cats find their way home? You know, Tefnut left, but she came home. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's been discovered that cats, as well as a variety of other species, including humans, possess an extraordinary sensitivity to the Earth's magnetic field. This sensitivity enables them and us to find our way home without visual clues. Um, I can remember when I was growing up, one of my favorite movies, what was it called? The Journey? journey home it was it was a story about um two dogs and a cat that had somehow been left by their owners i think they're maybe vacationing or something um and mistakenly left behind and their their journey across whatever <laughs> the mm -hmm. rough terrain to make their way home um and literally they you know probably the cat was the one who got home <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they did another one later that was, you know, even a little bit more comical than that. Um, but yeah, I've always been uh, intrigued by these senses. Um, and, you know, I do. Well, think you hear these stories often that cats who were lost, you know, yes. find their way to their even uh, to owners, new houses that have moved since the yes. cat just shows up. <laughs> find their owners um, and they have these senses that I'm talking about. I actually had a cat here in Egypt that um, somehow was taken apart from me um, uh, to another village and she made her way back to me. Um, she, she was an amazing, amazing cat. They all are. <laughs> yes, I'm a cat lover. Um, and so again, why, why this place? Um, you know, you, you think of all the anomalies of Egypt, but they do say that Giza is the center of the uh, Earth's landmass, basically the Earth's navel. Um, and, uh, you know, there's so many theories about what, what the pyramids are harnessing. Why are they there? Are they stabilizing energy? Uh, you know, there's just so many theories um, and so many thoughts and ideas. But I do believe they were harnessing currency to create uh, fields of energy that um, would keep us at our highest state of consciousness for as long as they possibly could, you know, until literally everything fell out of mud. I think, you know, the ancients had this high sense of awareness. Um, you know, we were all seshu, we were all seshet, we had these senses, we knew what was coming, and so we built these incredible structures to um, not only as as um, as halls of records for us, you know, when we would awaken and and discern all, you know, all this knowledge that they embody, but also um, to create these force fields that would have kept us in a higher state of consciousness for as long as possible. Just my my feelings about it. Mm, which seem to still be working. Which seem to be, yeah, they're still active. Um, not as active as they were when, you know, when they had the running water underneath, you know, these structures all over Egypt had running water underneath them and we don't have the floods anymore, but boy, you know, if something ever happened to the dam and, and I hope it doesn't because there's too many people that live along the Nile, but you know, the, the life force would be returned again. Um, and who knows, you know, and we're going to talk about that as well. Um, even cyclically, how the life force will be restored to Egypt and to the earth. But you asked what does, what does the <laughs> tongue hanging out mean? Yeah. Well, it could have something to do with this. Um, uh, the lions are also associated um, and, and symbolically with cyclical floods and rebirth. Um, and uh, so oftentimes you'll see like, you know, Tefnut with the water coming out of her mouth. 
And here you see the two lions and above these two lions that come together to form one head, right? Two mm -hmm. dual, dual opposing currents come together for the flood, you know, the life force coming out of their mouth, mouth, <laughs> their, their mouth. <laughs> mm -hmm. But above them, you see the masculine and the feminine coming together, right? So that's the reuniting of the two hemispheres uh, to come together as one. Um, yeah, imagery you'll find all over the world is exactly the same. <laughs> I I know when I see some things I go crazy because I see so much symbolism in them, um, and so this is at <laughs> Kurtamukha and the entrance of the Hindu temple in Kathmandu, Nepal, and I looked at this and just went wow. <laughs> Because you're looking at, you know, the face is right there when, where you would see the solar sun disk. And, you know, it's an image of, I think, an aspect of Bess. It's, it's Bess, right? And probably it's Ketu or, or Rahu, you know, but they also are metaphors for this understanding. Mm -hmm. um, but you're looking at this, you know, you see the two currents. You see the consciousness, the two eyes coming together and the two currents. And, you know, at that vertical point, un, you know, in a gateway, right? Um, and uh, there you see the currency of Draco, right? <laughs> Basically in his mouth. Um, and at the top, you see the, the pine cone shape of the pineal, right? The face of God at the center of Draco. Um, I just think it's interesting. So this Kurta Mukha is basically the name of a ferocious demon with horns, open mouth and great fangs. Um, it is usually placed on top of openings such as doors, windows, and arches. Uh, so, I, you know, do you see it or am I just? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's everywhere. And this is at the Kalasa Temple in India. I've been here a couple times um, and just blown away by the structure um, built out of a basalt cliff, um, literally carved out of basalt. But at the top, I've always loved this. The very top of this, this temple, you see there's your birthing box and the four lions, you know, coming out at the center. And they're on this big lotus. You know, this is birth, right? Um, and the Ashoka pillar uh, also with the four faces of the lion. This is the ecliptic pole. And here we have, again, the, the throne um, and the ark, the power of God on earth. And we see it's always a lion form uh, associated with it. You can actually see um, on the image on the right, the, you know, the, the lion figures um, that are basically moving with uh, the image of the God of the King uh, um, on, on the uh, being carried in the shrine. Um, again, powerful imagery. And then the throne and you have the cherubim there <laughs> mm -hmm. um, on either side. You know, you can't tell me that the Ark of the Covenant doesn't have something to do with this. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, here we have the two lions coming together and they're holding the crown, right? We crown the king, the dual crown <laughs> of Upper and Lower Egypt, or in this case, this looks like one of the crowns of Europe um, with the Ten Commandments underneath, you know, Ark of the Covenant. Um, it looks like they even have little, you know, golden chalices at their feet. Um, sometimes the cherubim are illustrated as lions. Um, and here you have, you know, this image on the pillar of a winged lion. Right in Venice. Yes, yeah. But you see it in other areas too. It's, it's, it's again, this, this, this is. Which symbolism. is another very interesting place, St. Mark's Square in Venice. Uh -huh. So I've never been to Venice. It's on my list. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so then this line, it's it like I said, it splits like the twins of Gemini, Shu and Tefnu, and begins to move. Creation is separation, right? As as uh, we begin to fall off our axis, um, and so uh, the arc moves. And I I I love that in this illustration, you see a harpist um, leading the way. And um, you know, when we were uh, at the opposite end, 12,000 years ago, give or take, um, you know, we were pointing toward the pole star in the constellation of Lyra, which is a heart, right? 
Um, I, Which is I, inter interesting that we have uh, the imagery of angels playing harps, angles of light yeah. and the sound of a harp. Yep. Mm. Beautiful resonance of the beautiful, I love, you know, I, I was on a tour with Annie Williams last year and oh, it's just so divinely beautiful. Um, yeah, no, no, no accidents happening here with, with symbolism. Um, but yeah, life is movement. The sign sound wave serpent that is the life force. We begin our descent into separation consciousness. And isn't um, the star Vega in the yes, constellation Lyra? Okay, which is a yes, harp. It is. Yes, it is. So yeah, um, that was basically um, uh, a divine feminine perception of reality um, when we were probably more focused or right brained and uh, we've fallen into being more focused on left brain. Mm. Um, so from intuitive, creative, artistic into analytical and <laughs> mind based from heart based consciousness to mind based consciousness. Um, so again, here is this the lions of the Acre, Shu and Tefnut um, and uh, you know, the twins of Gemini, they separate. One goes south and one goes north. The image below is from the uh, Narmer palette, right? Which is basically um, early dynastic, pre-dynastic. Um, it's, it's ancient. Right, one but, of the oldest ancient Egyptian artifacts. Exactly. And here you see these two, these two animal figures with lion heads um, and, you know, looped around each other like currency. And um, the two, uh, you know, images of these little men pulling their heads apart, right? Um, and underneath them, these are the twins of Gemini. Underneath them is actually um, a bull, a, a bull of Taurus. So this palette is speaking to these cycles. Hmm. and how things change as we move through time and space. Um, and we've shown this image before and, and we see what is coming out of the mouth, right? Two currents, dual opposing wave spin um, and uh, the depictions of the sun and the moon day and night. We fall into form. And when this happens, falling out of balance with the tilt of the earth, and I spelled it tilt really wrong. <laughs> Um, we, we move from 360 to 365 and a quarter days. Um, and the story, the mythological story to describe this, um, is, 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 is they utilize the five netters of Nephet, Isis, Set, Horus, and Osiris. Um, it is said that Talfa Jehudi is cosmic consciousness creates these five netaru to explain these extra days. And so their mythology, um, which we've talked a little bit about, and we will talk more about, that all of the mythology about these five netters is speaking to what happens when we fall into form. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're, all of their stories tell the story that we've been talking about. That's how it all ties together. That's how it all ties together. So here we have um, some uh, the Isis from 1 BC and a Roman version of Osiris. And you can see the one Osiris is wrapped in the currency, right? Mm -hmm. Mummified by currency, you know, or we've seen him wrapped in his own wings. Um, so, you know, all symbolically representing the magnetic field. And um, the Isis figure is holding the dual opposing currents, right? She's mastering these dual opposing currents feminine energy she was known as the magician harnessing the currents magic again from magnetism exactly so so um we've heard so many stories about the shem suhor the followers of Horus, and i you know they were known as demi gods and i believe that this moment that we we fall into form you know at that highest state we were in the age of Aten, as we talked about so the highest form of consciousness and a physical re, uh, perception of reality and so as we fall we become the followers of the whore the whore being that perfect current in mott 
um, in perfect balance, harmonic resonance, and then we fall into separation consciousness. And in the beginning, we we become, you know, we move from being gods to demi gods, and that's how the Shem Su Hor are described. So our our levels of conscious awareness begin to devolve. Uh, but we're still, you know, we're still mastering currents. We still have a higher state of consciousness. But, you know, we're followers of the whore as we devolve. I think we're still followers of the whore. Um, but as we migrated through procession, the currents split, moved with the changes in the angle, uh, with the angle of the sun hitting the earth. Um, and that that is changing, you know, our perception and conscious awareness, as I've said. And I believe that the magnetic equator actually, and I've spoken to my friend, the geologist about this, um, the possibility that this ancient magnetic equator just slowly moved down as we pre pre precessed through, um, you know, through the circumpolar spin through the ages, so that this, this beautiful balanced ancient magnetic equator just slowly fell out of balance as it moved down the Nile, right? to all these different temples and then to where it is today in uh, basically all over the place around Ethiopia. Or in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, they say, right? In Axum? Yep, yep, and we are gonna get to that. So yeah, um, um, you know, that's the path, right? That's, uh, <laughs> oh, well, here, and I'll talk about in a second, but here's another beautiful image I took at the National Museum I think History Museum in um, New Delhi in India. I love this image. Um, and you see these two lions and they're going in different directions, the splitting of the two lions. And in the center, you see the feminine image um, harnessing the one current or lion and the masculine on the other. And in the center, it looks almost like a grail, right? Um, the heart, the center, the wisdom of the heart. And we move away from that, the splitting of the two um, feline energies. So, um, and then the image on the far left, again, showing, you know, this moment of gnosis when everything comes back to center. And then um, again, as we separate separation consciousness, we lose our high levels of consciousness. We devolve into separation consciousness. More images of the Holy Grail. I think I've shown this slide before. Um, it's just beautiful, uh, but feminine energy, heart-based energy. And again, I'm not talking about ma males and females as, you know, as we are today. I'm talking about the energy that exists within all of us. Mm -hmm. We both have masculine and feminine sides. Um, so, and, and I do love this quote by Marion Woodman. Um, and she says, the true feminine is the receptacle of, receptacle of love. The true masculine is the spirit that goes into the eternal unknown in search of meaning. The great container, the self, is paradoxically both male and female and contains both. If these are projected onto the outside world, transcendence ceases to exist. The self, the inner wholeness, is petrified. Without the true masculine spirit and the true feminine love within, no inner life exists. To be free is to break the stone images and allow life and love to flow. Sounds like everything I've just been talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So the Holy Grail, again, is the heart. It's our primordial egg of unlimited potentials, the still point of our turning world. The search for that still point is a perennial spiritual quest, one that has inspired seekers since time immemorial. If we can rest in that stillness, the sages say we will find the peace that surpasses all understanding. For in that peace and colorless stillness, we can find Gnosis, our highest state of consciousness. And again, it's why we are encouraged to go within and meditate, to find that stillness within. That's when our aha moments happen. Mm. Um, and so I, I, I showed this in, an, in a you know, recent episode um, but again, it speaks to this understanding. So, you know, it's good to see it again. Um, you know, this is, this is the heart emerging into um, that center of the uh, magnetic field that surrounds us. Um, and, uh, you know, the facing away from each other, the lions, 
the lines form the electromagnetic container, the matrix of the mind. And when they come back together, they create the portal to the sun, the center, or the lion's heart. These are the lion's gates. Um, so where is Horus? I keep asking that, you know, we find, you know, we, we, we go around the circumpolar stars, but we can also follow the path of the magnetic equator. Um, Telaric currents continuously move between the sunny and dark sides of the earth toward the equator on the side of the earth facing the sun during the day and toward the poles on the night side of the planet. What hour is it? To determine the angle of the ray of the sun and the most significant earth current. <laughs> the earth, the current magnetic equator, as I've shown it to you before, you know, having gone from this wonderful harmonic uh, line of resonance to this chaotic um, mess, <laughs> <laughs> which is sort of where we're at now, right? Um, and so, yes, the Seshu Hor, Akim said it was uh, misunderstood or translated as Shemsu, it should be Seshu. Um, and of course, from Sashet, uh, that we all had the ability to feel the currents as demigods, as followers of Horus, um, and um, as we begin to lose our connection to the vine, divine. So, yeah. Um, and there is, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, as they begin to lose that connection, they develop these tools and staffs and wands and things to reestablish to to extend their own central nervous system and allow it to pick up on these energies again right absolutely and i'm, I'm actually glad you said that and and yeah uh, the last episode you brought up the work of dr ibrahim kareem and biogeometry and this is really a focus of his work today and he also traces this that yes, they the, the staffs, we, you know, we use tools today, but the ancients also developed the staffs and the tools um, and pendulums to measure the currents they could no longer feel. So yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, <clears throat> and so the Torrens Kings list is quite interesting. Um, it was written during the reign of Ramses II, 19th dynasty, and it includes the names of the Neteru, the ancestors, right. <laughs> spirits, and demigods. The, the first Lord. kings. The, yep, the first human king listed was King Menes, or Narmer, um, and that was at about 32 to 3000 BC, 5,000 years ago, age of Taurus, right? This so is when you think we... We fell into form. We fell into form, right? You know, right, right uh, at the onset of the age of Taurus, which is basically about six thousand years ago. But of course, thoroughly into form in uh, by five thousand BC. Um, not thoroughly. We, we've been falling all along. But and here's the Narmer palette that, that uh, I showed you just a little bit of before, and you can see that there's the bull in the bottom, the age of Taurus. Age of Gemini, and uh, there's the opening of the mouth for the rebirth of humanity. Um, oh, really, really, just amazing symbolism. So I think we'll stop there for today. That sounds like a good place to stop. <laughs> yes, because there's more. Oh, we have <laughs> I, I like to say coming. the best is coming, but this is all, it's all fascinating. It's all <laughs> Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Again, our website is horusrising.com. Thanks, Patricia, for everything. Thank and you, Alan. Everybody, please like, share, and subscribe. We'll be back with more soon. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.